So let's start with your retirement. As I know a lot of the fans will be keen to hear from you and kind of why you came to that decision. I guess to some it might have come as a bit of a surprise. You're only 32 and, and you had the gloves. What, what triggered that decision? That's a good question, actually. Um, I think it boils down to a, a number of factors and a number of contributing things that ended up to where I am now. Um, mainly personal. Um, I didn't feel like I was consistently at a stage where I was happy with my performances. Um, and, and people in the team I felt could do a better job. Um, and it felt as if I was, you know, I was pulling from a, a tank or a reservoir and not putting back in for a, quite a considerable amount of time, if I'm being honest, since I came back to Essex from Hampshire. Um, and I wasn't putting back in, so then it just felt like a very empty, you know, a very empty part of what I was pulling from and not really being able to get up again to perform. And that's that's how it ended up. I, can't, I guess one thing you allude to there is a, a uniqueness around the keeper spot in that you can have, within reason, as many batters and bowlers as you like within the team, but there's there's kind of only one spot for some with the gloves. And throughout your time at Essex and Hampshire as well, you had periods with the gloves, periods without the gloves. Is that quite hard from a professional point of view, but also personal? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's, it's a hard spot, um, but so is every spot. You know, you speak to the bowlers, you speak to the batters, they've all got their challenges. It's unique in a way, there's only one. Um, and But I've always wanted to be a wicketkeeper, so, so I, I knew that from a very early age of selection of the regional staff, England on the 19s. I knew you're, you're always competing for one spot. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's a little bit mi misunderstood because people don't get it. Like, I don't understand how a bowler feels after a day's play because I've never been there. And in your, your final innings, you, you batted for three and a half hours, scored 33 from 174 balls. It might not have been the, uh, the trademark Adam Wheater innings, but it was crucial for the team and it, it saved that game against North Hans. I'm curious, did, when you went out to play the innings, did you, did you know that was going to be the last innings you played for the club? No, I didn't know it was my last innings I was going to play for the club. I knew the next day I was going to go around Wes's house and speak to and speak to Mags about where I was feeling and where I was at. So I, I, I knew that potentially might have been my last game, um, but nothing was set in stone as, as of then. And, and how were those conversations with, with Wes and Mags? Good. You know, I, I was honest um, and, it, and it more came from me. I just said, look, I, I don't think I can perform um, anymore. You know, before that, I'd spoken to people. I made sure I looked at my stats and, and where they were at, and they were massively down. You know, can, your career at my age was meant to be going up. And from the first half of my career to my second half of my career, it was chalk and cheese. Um, so I, I sort of knew then that, you know, it was the right, right thing to do. I didn't want to be a journeyman or playing for the sake of it. I, I thought that was disrespectful to the club and the players that I was playing with because at the time I felt that that team you know had, had a chance of winning the, the championship this year and I didn't want to be playing knowing that I couldn't give 100%. And and I mean on the face of things if you look back at your stats it first class average of 35 1200 to double 100 as well I mean when you look back there's got to be an element of, of, of satisfaction because especially for a keeper those are pretty top standard stats yeah and, and strange like i said before the strange they'd gone down you know, i think I, I came back to essex averaging 40 odd um which is a, it doesn't seem like a lot but over a season it actually equates to to a fair bit and you know if i was more consistent or reaching those standards that i knew i'd reached in the past i probably wouldn't be in this situation but that, that that's the facts and that, that game against North Hans ended on the 1st of May this year and, and you've not been resting on your laurels since. Can you give us an idea as to, as to what you've been up to the past five months? It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, Full-time dad, you know, it's been, it's been good to spend time with my daughter who's two now um, and a lot of coaching. You know, we've, we've got a company called the Club Cricket Academy and, you know, that's going pretty well and it's been 
it's been interesting because I've seen the side of cricket that I haven't seen in a long time, you know, the recreational stuff, the grassroots stuff. So that's been, you know, very pleasing to be honest. And you know, it's a little bit less stressful than, than performing out there, which has been nice, I suppose, and, and probably something that I, I didn't appreciate whilst I was, was playing professional cricket and, and seeing what, what's out there. Um, and from that side of things it's, things, it's been good as well. And, and you mentioned seeing what's out there. Are there any kind of uh, avenues that you might be looking to explore outside of cricket as well? Yeah, there, there are a few. Probably some that are more appealing to others. You know, a friend's got a construction company and we're, we're talking about that at the minute, which, which is quite interesting, but nothing set, of, set in stone as of yet. And lots of players have kind of spoken about the almost mental process of retirement and for some it, it's a very personal thing some feel quite uncomfortable with it others say that they wake up one day and they just kind of know that their time in the professional game is done it sounds a bit more like you relate to the latter does the fact that you have ambitions outside of the game and in the grassroots side of things help with that process i, I think it certainly did help knowing that you know, all bills and stuff will be covered after if I do retire. Um, I think, you know, every person's position is unique. Um, it is something that I've always sort of kept an eye on. If you don't play for England or you're, you know, hugely successful in the franchise stuff, then you know you're working after you finish playing. Um, so whether that was me at my age at 32 or 36 or 37, it, all, it was always going to be the case. So I've, I probably had an eye on that. Um, for a long period now, longish period, um, always sort of tried to get some experience or learn a different skill. So I'm, I'm sure that you know did contribute. It wasn't as much of a waking up and I'm I'm done. You know, there's there's processes and there's things and ifs and and buts. And all of that being said, um, Essex and, and this cricket club is clearly a very special place to you. You started. Your career here before before leaving and then returning you experienced unprecedented success and, and you shared all of those memories with the likes of tom wesley who you started your journey here with back in the academy in 2006. how strongly do you feel that emotional bond with the club but also the people involved here as well yeah like you know it's such a cliche that it's a family club or all the players a lot of the players that are playing now are, are local and it it's huge you know to to be born and bred Essex and then represent exactly who you wanted to represent um, from when you were a kid. You know, it was it's a great feeling. You know, my my idols were Nasser Hussain and James Foster, but simply because they were Essex boys, they went to the same school, we were born in the same hospital. I'm not sure about Nasser, but Foster certainly was. So yeah, it, it's huge. Um, and you know, you can put that down to a lot of the success that. Essex have had as well. And going back to those formative years in the Essex Academy, you worked with John Childs and, and Barry Hyam. And, and I don't know if you know, but John wrote about you in the 2007 yearbook. They expected you to go on and get a pro contract firstly, but also likened your mindset to Alistair Cook's. What was it like for you in those years? And, and what role did John and Barry play in your career development at that early stage it's huge yeah John John put me on the academy and, and he was a great sounding board you know just mm. a solid solid guy that like we've mentioned there cared deeply about Essex you can see it now you know he hasn't been on the academy for a while but he's been behind the scenes from then up until now trying to do what's right for Essex and you look at you know, people like Graham Gooch again they they don't have to be here and they they have done because of their love love for Essex and at that point as a 17 year old if your career was laid out in front of you and you were told that you play a key role in multiple championship wins lift the t20 trophy score a first class double hundred you'd have taken that in a heartbeat wouldn't you yeah i would have um you know looking back on that success people go their whole careers without that better players than me have gone their whole careers without that level of success a hundred percent you know especially at the start where essex you know arguably you know, 2008, 2012 period. I know there's a few trophies won, one day stuff, but they probably would have said that they underachieved in that period. So then to come back, having left that um, first initial spell with Essex, to come back and, and have the success that we did, absolutely no problem. And you mentioned your, your two spells 
with Essex. You almost span two generations of, of teams. And in terms of the success, the obvious highlight is, is those four years between 2017 and 2020. But what are your memories like from that team you broke into? Because you played a huge amount of cricket with the likes of Tim Phillips, Mark Pettini, Jake McElbrough. Yeah, it feels like such a long time ago now. You know, I still speak to Pips. He's a good, good friend of mine, and I think that's the bond we share. That you know, playing professional cricket together is quite unique. Um, it's very different. Then we had a lot of people coming and going. Um, you know, Ravi and Alistair Cook. They were in and out of the England fold. Tendo was in and out of IPL. Um, Billy Godman as well. That I'm friends with. So there was a, you know, there was a, there was a bit less consistency in the team that we had out. Um, week in week out but you know, again like thanks to Essex for giving me the opportunity um, to then go on to have you know a fairly lengthy career is you know it's been amazing and maybe a lesser known Adam Wheat stat that came towards the end of that first spell is is the first class wicket can you talk us through that one yeah I, I, the, the kids I coach now I, I tell them that I've got one of the highest economy rates in the world ever and they're like oh, that originally they think it's a success and then they go actually how how big is that i think it's 22 and a half um it was, it was, uh, four overs for 86 i think yeah, was that 22 and a half and over yeah. um yeah back in the day you don't see it as much now you used to be able to almost forfeit a bowling innings to then chase something so it was rain affected um for basically teams in div 2 to try and get up um, and give that both teams a fair share of of winning that game um, actually, that game, Mark Pettini got went for more than me in less balls. But yeah, strangely, I've, that's the only time I've bowled in first class cricket since. What do you bowl? I don't, but if I was ha if I had to, I'd bowl left arm seam because my spin, I'd, I'd pitch it halfway down. You won't be teaching that one to the kids then? No, I try and stay away from that. Do as I say, not as I do. When you returned back to Essex for that 2017 season, you played alongside James Foster um, for a couple more years before he retired. And and then when he did retire, you kind of became that undisputed number one with the gloves. How, how was that experience of playing alongside him for a bit longer? I know you mentioned the, the past you and two have had, um, and then stepping into that role of, of outright first choice keeper. Yeah, that was a tough one, to be honest. Um, like I said before, Foz was my idol growing up and I played with him in the first stint, and then, but I never felt like I was competing with him. I, I played more as a batter then, uh, when the likes of Ravi and Chef are away. Um, and then to come back, I moved back purely for personal reasons. You know, I wanted to be back in Essex. My wife wanted to be back in Essex. We felt like it was a, it was the right time to make that move back. Um, so to to get signed, I was sort of happy with, you know, and, and there, there was talk of Foz moving on with his coaching career and whatnot. So Essex almost wanted a, a backup side of things. So, so to compete with him, wasn't wasn't the best situation. I mean, Foz got on well. We still get on well, and we knew it was nothing down to us. It was the decisions made by the powers that be. Um, but when Foz left and and, and whatnot, you know, there was a huge amount of pressure with the gloves because of how good he was, um, and that made me for the first time, I reckon, because I had a bit of a howler when I first came in. 2017 keeping wise that made me really understand that I've you know I've got to improve and get better or perform better if I'm even going to look like a wicket keeper that Essex have seen 15 years of Foz doing here so I almost just didn't want to do him a disservice um, yeah and then Foz moved on and the last few years it's, it's sort of been me with the gloves yeah and, and you obviously at that point went on to form that that brilliant partnership of Harmer, which must have been really satisfying. Probably not the easiest bowler to keep to keep to, and 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 to kind of perform so consistently well. That must have been. You must have felt very very pleased with that. Yeah, I mean, Harmy came the same year as I did. I think um, 2017 back, and at first, you know, it made me look stupid. You know, I was missing balls. And I'm never going to get them. It's not my fault. It's the pitch. And then it, I, had, I had to seriously improve to get to the standard of, of what Harmy needed. And I knew he was our biggest threat. So if I was missing stuff behind the stumps, then I'm not really going to get anywhere. Um, and then you got used to it. You, you know, you learn that like, he doesn't really beat people on the outside edge. So I was going more inside edge to right-handers. And, and we developed a good partnership. 
by that I mean I, I caught more balls off him and he just bowled them but yeah I, I certainly got a better understanding of what he was doing um, the more I kept to him and it, then it become then it became enjoyable because I knew what was going to happen I, I knew I was going to get the more more balls than I ever have done from a spinner and um, it became a really really good challenge and it just made four day cricket days go rapid because he was at one end and it took full concentration every ball for me to catch to him so yeah he made he made the days go really quick and i guess that that going through that challenge gives you some really good learnings to pass on when you're coaching as well having to kind of go through that thought process and understand how world-class bowlers work yeah i mean for some i've done it for so long that you you have to be your own coach right like there are coaches there and they do great job you know more than anyone your own game and what you have to do to improve and, and how to go about it so yeah I'm sure hopefully that puts me in good stead to sort of pass on that knowledge um, to young players. So you went on to win the championship and the T20 double in 2019 an incredible feat you followed that up with the Bob Willis trophy in 2020 adding to the championship you already won in 2017 it seems like an obvious question but but was that the highlight of your career? Yeah, it was. You know, the, strangely, I got asked this the other the other day. And I, don't, I don't see it as a year. I see it as a week. Obviously, the games continued, and 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 the games stretched a six month period, start of April to when did we finish? Late September. It was a long period, but it was just a week where we won it in that week, and yeah, it was amazing. Highly stressful because 2020 it looked like we weren't even going to win it, and then Harmy and Rav pulled it out of the bag. Typical Harmy. And then again, the four day game, you know, if we've played 50 more overs, that could have been a completely different result. So we're always, I always felt as if we were proper struggling for a lot, a lot of periods of, of winning those two trophies, but you know, amazing, maybe we're just written in the stars. Yeah, can you, can you give us a kind of insight into what it's like to be in a team environment during a week like that, that, that no amount of preparation can, can ready you for? Yeah, like, I was fairly blasé about the, the 2020 because you see teams go in their favourites and they don't walk away with a trophy and you, you've seen underdogs win that and whatnot. And that, you know, 2020 feels like a little bit of a lottery. Like that year we snuck in on the last day, five results going our way in the um, group stages to then go to Durham against Lancashire in a quarterfinal. It's all bizarre and, and whatnot. Whereas the the four day stuff you feel like the best team will win that four day game in general and after winning the 2020 it's almost like oh my god we could actually win two trophies in a week here and everyone was trying to like play it down be cool and and whatnot and then i then i saw like alistair cook be like nervous like watching the rain and I thought, geez, if he's nervous, like I've got to be nervous now because he he's seen it. Oh, he's won Ashes, and now he's in Taunton, and he can't sit still. He's watching the rain every two seconds. So, from that point of view, we we knew what what was on the cards um, after we'd won the 2020. And yet, looking back, it must have, as well as being an incredibly intense but and joyful time, it must have been quite surreal as well because that kind of consistent dominance I'm, I'm talking about over that four-year period is pretty much unheard of in county cricket yeah we 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 had a good formula here at home in particular like you know, it was i think it was the year of bob willis trophy or, or after that we hadn't lost here for ages and whatnot and it became you know really good fun they were seriously tough games because they weren't your 400s play 400s grind it out it was cricket and fast forward basically um yeah, a lot of a lot of pressure, but a lot of enjoyable times as well. And I guess having that sort of success towards the back end of your career, does that mean you could kind of leave the professional game with no feelings of unfinished business? I think so. Yeah, I think I'd be looking at my career, given the same amount of stats and whatnot, if I hadn't won anything as a as a pretty big disappointment. You know, uh, I know it's a team game and you can't control things. Like I said, better players have not won as much as we have. But from my point of view, definitely, if, if, you know, if, 
if we hadn't won anything, I'd have thought, cool, that was, it was good to be a professional cricketer for that period of time, but it wasn't much achieved. And you spoke earlier about your interest in the, the grassroots side of the game and outside of cricket as well. Do you see yourself wanting to get back involved in the professional side of the game or are you happy to be kind of Adam Wheater cricket fan from now on? Yeah, of course, like crystal ball there, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure. As of yet, I'm very happy with what we're doing at the Club Cricket Academy. Um, you know, taking care of the recreational sports, the side of things. Um, but m maybe, but in the f near future, no, I don't think that will, will be the case. Um, I'll leave it to a lot more qualified and capable people than me. And you're clearly a, a, a family man. You have one kid. Is it another one? Another one on the way? Another one on the way, yeah. And are you, will you be the kind of dad to be giving them throwdowns as soon as they can hold a bat or is it going to be hands off, it's you decide? Be, it's going to be quite interesting. I love coaching girls. Girls, you know, they, the worst thing they do is talk. Those boys, you know, young boys, they're hitting each other with bats and, and whatnot and I'm going to end up with, with two girls. They can do what they want. You know, if they want to play cricket, cool. If, you know, if they want to sing, dance, play football, as long as they're happy and that's what they want to do, go for it. Now, I'm not going to be one of those parents um, that are telling them what to do. Neither was my dad. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to follow, follow in his footsteps and, and take them to stuff they want to, and if they don't, so be it. And, and looking forward to next year. Cricket's done it at Chelmsford now for this season, but looking forward to next year, will members and fans maybe see, see you wandering around the concourse? Yeah, for sure. I you know, I followed Essex this summer. You know, I've I've been here and and watching more as a spectator than a player. And definitely, I live around the corner and and I've got mates playing. So 100. percent